Uh, someone posted to my Facebook saying that the next time that I give a speech, that I ought to talk about why religious believers hate reality so much. And I knew that that was intended as a joke. But I think there's actually a topic there worthy of exploration because that really does seem to be the case. Uh, for example, last month a creationist commented on one of my videos challenging me to show him the, the evidence of evolution, which of course I was happy to share. He said he wanted to know what I know and to show him the data. But very quickly he told me that he didn't actually want to see any data. Instead, he said, and I quote, let me be more clear in my request. Forget about you and your interpretation of the data. Just show me the transformation so I can observe it for myself. Can you show me a fish turning into an amphibian over millions of years? Don't show me a line of fossils. Don't explain anything about genetics at all. I want to observe exactly how fish turn into amphibians." Unquote. So first of all, he's talking about an individual fish turning into an individual amphibian over millions of years. So he knows fuck all about evolution. <laughs> he doesn't have the first clue and he doesn't want one either. He's made very clear that he doesn't want to understand how we know, that we, how we know what we know. He doesn't want to know that we know anything that he doesn't want to believe. And he doesn't want to know it himself because of course he doesn't want to believe it. He doesn't want to know what's really true if it's not what he wants to believe. He wants to believe something else, something that he knows is not really true, or at least probably not really true. And if it isn't true, he doesn't want to know that either. He wants to remain willfully ignorant. So instead of any honest inquiry, he asks that I show him only the one thing that he knows I could never show him no matter how true evolution is, no matter how right. I am, which he already suspects that I am. He doesn't want to see any of the proof. He only wants to see what he knows would take both time travel and immortality to display for him because we would have to go back in time hundreds of millions of years and then stand around for another hundred million years watching fish learn how to salamander. <laughs> and even if I had a time machine and a means of genetically tracing, you know, to select exactly which individual fish is in our direct ancestry, because you know, there would be one individual fish at one point that would be the direct ancestor for all of us. But if we were able to, able to identify that one, and we start watching that one, then when that first fish died, he would have said that it didn't turn into something else beforehand, so I still failed to show him what he asked for. Even with a time machine, he wouldn't be able to satisfy these people. However, I am convinced that if we had a TARDIS, and we invited one of these young earth creationists, you know, the people that think that the earth is less than 10,000 years old, to get into this time machine with us and go back 100 million years or so, they wouldn't get in because they know as well as we do what they'll see when they come out. And this is a reality they refuse to accept and damn sure won't admit it. One woman told me that if even if I had a time machine and could use it to prove to her that what she believes is not true, she said that she wished or that she hopes that she, her faith is strong enough to keep believing even when her eyes tell her otherwise. That's why I ask why religious believers hate reality so much. And that's why they only ask for what you still couldn't provide, no matter how true evolution is, because on some level, many of them know that what they believe is not the truth. And they know that uh, they have to make believe, and they know that we don't have to make believe because reality really does conform to our position. And I'll explain how we know that they know that. A lot of people, including some prominent atheists, say that these people are sincere believers, but I don't see how they can be. There are some people who believe honestly or for honest reasons, but those people would ask honest questions too. And that distinguishes the sincere believer from the, uh, the dogmatic religious apologist, which are the people I'm talking about now. I often say that it's not possible to defend creationism honestly because when a sincere believer ends up investigating the evidence and arguments of both sides of this alleged controversy, they very quickly face a life-altering choice, whether to remain honest or whether to remain creationist, because it is no longer possible to be both. What this commenter asked for was, uh, and I know I'm gonna mispronounce this because I can't say it, I can never say this right, a reductio ad absurdum fallacy, allowing him to ignore all the evidence and ask, were you there? And this uh, infantile attempt at a gotcha 
is a deliberately dishonest excuse that creationists often cite in order to pretend that no one really knows what the truth is if there was no one there to see it. And um, it's the defense of the guilty that, you know, you can't prove it so I can still pretend what I want to. And uh, they know that eyewitnesses are the least reliable form of evidence. And they know that any other evidence of any other type will rebut that eyewitness. And they know that detectives can still tell what happened even when there are no eyewitnesses, or worse, when there is an eyewitness committing perjury on the stand, which shows a nice parallel for the religious beliefs because they have a book that they, they want to portray as being the word of an eyewitness. But, as you've known, many religious believers like to pretend to witness things they've never really seen, and everything they believe are empty assertions of impossible nonsense. Remember that all of the major religions were founded by mystics, who thought that dreams were cryptic visions of divine inspiration and that any emotional impression or coincidental sequence of events could be taken as a sign from God. It's a belief system based on credulity, on confirmation bias, and anything but critical or rational thought. Very much the opposite, in fact. Instead, they're encouraged to go with their gut feeling and to treat the scriptures, their supposedly sacred scriptures, as the only source of truth in our world, and I've heard many, attribute, many statements to that effect. That's literally saying, if the Bible is the only thing that is true, that the whole of reality is a lie. And I've seen them attest to this. In one case, it was even a, a Christian textbook in a young earth creationist school that a friend of mine was running. And uh, this textbook, laughably, obviously, was all, all, it, itself a lie because it wasn't the Bible, but you know, these people aren't really good at logic. This is why winning the football game is taken as proof of God, but the fact that God can't heal amputees doesn't mean anything, and neither does anything Epicurus ever said, because he should have shut down this argument a couple dozen centuries ago. The people who wrote the holy books obviously didn't know what their gods should have, or they wouldn't have written the stories that they did. It's very clearly written not from the perspective of somebody that created the entirety of the universe, but from somebody that thought that the world was flat, and so they put a giant crystal dome over it because they think space is full of water, and never mind, that's going to be another lecture. People who uh, pretend that the, these scriptures are the word of God, and they, they, they pretend to witness for the truth of that word, are committing perjury and bearing false witness. There was a cop show in the 60s that was famous for this one detective saying, just the facts, whenever anybody would you know, speak up about their speculations. If we'd all adhered to that, there'd be no religion. Because if there's not one fact anyone can verify to be true or false about any god or religion, then there is nothing anyone can honestly say that they know about it either. And you can interpret the facts, but you shouldn't make shit up that has no truth to it. And if you do, you can't be calling it the absolute truth because the truth is what the facts are and they don't have any facts. And I realize that my talk today has a lot of language contrasting us and them. And I understand how normally you know, that would be uh, uh, tribal, and that's not my intent. I'm only drawing a comparison between two extremes, uh, between those who have a deep-seated emotional need to believe and the intellectually curious who have a desire to understand and to improve understanding, which is something that faith can't do. I'm aware that that's not a dichotomy and that most of us lie between those two extremes. But think of it as like the line between gay and straight. You know, from past experience, a number of you have already ascertained that that's a pretty broad overlap of gray area between those two, so I think my either-or comparison still works with the people who are at least 51% faithful versus the people who are at least 51% rational. And yes, faith is an irrational position. Rational people are described as having sound reason and the ability to reason and being willing to be reasoned with. A rational person believes only what is indicated, and they're tentative even then. So they may not believe everything completely. Maybe you know, some things they believe it's mostly true or generally true, but there's some part somewhere that's probably not right, and that's true really about pretty much any topic you want to talk about. So we consider other options when there is uncertainty. Rational people understand that what we believe is not a matter of choice. We accept what the evidence compels us to believe, and our minds will obligately change according to our understanding of the facts, regardless what we might have preferred to be true. But faith is the very opposite of that. 
being an assertion of un an unwarranted assertion of unreasonable conviction assumed without reason and defended against all reason. It is unwise to believe uh, anything without reservation, without question, or without reason, but yet you know, faith demands all three of these things at once, and that is irrational by definition. I'm reminded of this line from Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, where Gene Wilder's character says, you should never ever doubt what no one is sure about. When I first heard that about eight years old, I didn't realize yet that that's what religious faith was, but I knew that I'd met people who think like that, and that it was foolish and stupid to think that way. Some other YouTube commenter told me that I didn't have any evidence to back up my claims, and so he wanted me to show, I was gonna show him that as evidence, but I told him that we would do it in a public forum. They always wanna communicate in email or something, you know, where nobody else can see. But no, I want, you, I want you to be accountable. I want everybody else to see how you respond to the way I answer your question. And uh, religious extremists like creationists will not be accountable. Creationists always want to debate me, but what they usually want to do with that is they want to get me on a Google Hangout so that they can yell about how evil or stupid they think I am. Or they'd be perfectly happy to debate me on a live, with a live audience, you know, from stage. And the advantage they have there is that they can tell more lies in a minute than I could possibly correct in an hour. It's a tactic called the, the Gish Gallup, which is named after Dwayne Gish of the Institute for Creation Research. These people can cite any source you've never heard of and say anything they want to about it, and they know that there's no way you could possibly address that on the fly. For example, I was on a video discussion that was uh, not rehearsed or anything, it was just me and this seminary professor of philosophy at a seminary school in Texas, and he told me, among other things, that Daniel Dennett, everybody know who Daniel Dennett is? Okay. This philosophy professor told me that Daniel Dennett did not believe that, that Dennett himself existed because Dennett didn't believe that the human mind existed. Now, I've, I've met Dennett a few times, and I didn't think that he could actually think that, but I, I hadn't already read whatever the article was that this professor is talking about, so I have to give him the benefit of the doubt, and I have to go home and do the research and look up the specific citation to realize that that is neither what Dennett said nor what he meant. The philosophy pr pr professor is completely full of shit. He has no idea what he's talking about, and he's wrong, but because I couldn't correct him authoritatively in the moment, it looked like he was right, and it looked like he made a valid point. This is how the Gish Gallup works. That same philosophy professor also told me that evidence is not evident because facts are not factual and nothing can ever be objectively verified, not even mathematics, because he's an idealist where we don't all share the same reality because what is real for me is not necessarily real for him and if you believe hard enough, you can change reality and, and inconvenient truths will disappear if you ignore them. So I can't even prove that Dennett never said that within the confines of the private reality that goes on within that professor's head. He's one who doesn't object to reality in general, only to other people's reality, to objective reality, because he has his own personal reality that he doesn't have to share with anyone else. But if we all share the same reality, you know, the real one, where facts can be objectively verified, then you still can't be prepared for every erroneous factoid that it, your opponent may throw out. Right, because there's no way to, uh, to know how they're going to misread these things. I had a debate with a Christian radio host that was awful because he kept spitting out nonsense like a machine gun. And I'm doing all I can to try to correct all these lies in the amount of time that he's able to tell them all. But I did manage to get him to commit on the show, on air, to have a written debate with me which his fans would be able to look up. And we even were able to give the, the URL for where we were gonna hold this so that people could look it up and hold him accountable for this. And that was a very different environment because he showed up with all these citations of uh, peer-reviewed articles and everything. And I was able to read them, of course, to respond to them and realize that none of them said what he said they did. Though he wasn't able to understand why that was. What if he had done that in a live debate? Now, I'm able to show in the written debate how he had gotten absolutely everything he said wrong, embarrassingly, stupidly wrong. But in a live debate, it would look like he was winning. It would look like he knew more than me. So there's the problem with doing live debates. That sort of bullshit doesn't fly in a real debate the way it only can in a stage show, which is what their debates are. Political debates have a practical purpose, but otherwise, live debates are not the way anything is ever decided. And there's little or no purpose in having two people talk past each other 
to an audience that has usually already decided who the winner is before they've even begun. I want to engage my opponent directly to challenge him, get him to think, and to change his mind. And I want to do that with other people watching. Because as I said, there's a different behavior in private than in public. And if this person changes his mind in a private discussion, I can only tell people that he did and he'll just deny it. So it needs to be in public and it's best to do that when the conversation is also being monitored by experts in the field. I've seen creationists realize that they're talking to an expert and immediately change the subject to whatever is the furthest field away from that. I was in Dublin for a, an atheist conference and I'm with uh, P.Z. Myers and a bunch of uh, the Islamists surrounded him and they start talking about how they have this book written by this uh, developmental biologist, this embryologist, and this embryologist was coerced into making certain statements in support of the Quran, which he later recanted as soon as he got back to his own country. But they're still, per they're still uh, perpetuating this. And they said, well, how can you contest this? You know, because PZ is saying, well, this is wrong. They said, how can you contest this? This, this is this, his field. He's an expert. And PZ says, well, so am I. I'm an embryologist. I'm a developmental biologist. And they said, oh, really? Well, let's talk about geology then. <laughs> it was that overt, right? You know what you're talking about. We can't talk to you anymore because they know, right? That just like there was a t-shirt in the 70s that said, if you can't dazzle them with brilliance, baffle them with bullshit. The tactics display that, okay, well, you're, you, know, you, you know this field of embryology. We can no longer talk to you. We now have to find something else that will confuse you. So this shows that they know that they are only bullshitting you. And that's why they always demand a one-on-one -on -one discussion where no one who knows any better could offer any correction. They don't want to have a discussion in a scientific forum where there's a, where there's a geneticist and a geologist and so forth. They don't want anybody to be able to interject at all because it's all about confusing that one person. And they, they also want to do it in a forum where you can't actually show evidence. But the thing is, you can't have this kind of conversation on Twitter. You can't discuss science or philosophy or, or, or religion or anything in 140 characters, not in-depth concepts. Not when you, you need to be able to show your evidence, you need to be able to show in-depth explanations that are longer than that, and it should be something that you can provide a link to so that other people can follow the entire conversation in its entirety, in sequence and context, and you can't do that in YouTube comments or on Facebook either. So I usually hold these discussions on the League of Reason forums because there are a number of scientists who participate in there, and they're pedantic enough, I've learned, that they won't let anybody, either side, get away with saying anything wrong. I've seen where Christians will band with Muslims against the atheists, right? <laughs> as long as you're buying into the bullshit, then you're, you're on our team, but you know, the atheists, no. Uh, however, we are not even our own friends. So last month, I led one of my challengers to that forum where I published the first post of our debate. He'd agreed that he would have the debate there, uh, but he decided, I guess, that he couldn't counter the evidence that I had posted and he didn't think it would be that substantial either because he never showed up. I know he saw it, but I never heard it from him again. And that's the typical response I usually get from people who are only trying to defend a fantasy that they already know isn't really true. And for the last 20 years or so, I've challenged many creationists offering to prove that biological evolution is the truest, best explanation there is for the origin of our species. And as a bonus, I would also prove to their satisfaction that creationism is based entirely on frauds, falsehoods, and fallacies with not a word of truth in it because that really is the case. I've had a few believers try to challenge me too, saying that they could either prove the existence of God or disprove evolution. And in the latter case, it's almost always the God of the gaps fallacy, being arguments from ignorance and incredulity uh, combined with question begging, so that whatever science can't explain must be magic, though they'll never admit that that's what that is. Or it's a gross dis distortion or embarrassingly, excuse me, a gross distortion or embarrassingly bad misunderstanding of science. Like one of the common arguments is, this guy brings up how there's a, a woodpecker that has a, an overly long tongue that's all distorted and wraps around its skull before it comes out of its mouth, right? So this is disproof of somehow of evolution. And I said, well, this is completely consistent with the mutation. And I would tell you that this birth defect, this weird kind of deformity, definitely does not imply intelligence on the part of any assumed designer. So the next guy would say that evolution is disproved because scientists now admit that Neanderthals 
are not the missing link. And then I have to explain that nobody ever said Neanderthals were our ancestors, and we already knew about them before we started looking for the missing link, which is something else entirely. Oh, and by the way, we found it, though they'll never admit that. Because that's the part where they say that there's never been in any transitional species. So I show them the list, and there's never any admission of error. Instead, they change the subject to say that there's never been any beneficial mutations. And so I show them that list, and there's never any admission of error there either. Instead, they change the subject again or move the goalposts back even further. They can't admit any critical error, even when they know they're wrong because of the slippery slope. They have to convince themselves that God exists somehow and argue against everything else that they think stands against that. And that's why every discussion of how species diversify always changes into where the universe came from. As if that has anything to do, where the origin of planets has anything to do with descent with inherent genetic modification, that's what evolution is. What's that got to do with the Big Bang? The people who want to disprove evolution can't do it because they don't know what it is, and they don't want to because they don't want to risk believing it. The people who want to prove the existence of God are much funnier. And typically, that's the logical fallacy of question begging again, but this time combined with the fallacy of false dichotomy, and it's so that uh, disproving science somehow proves God. And most of the time that depends on the fallacy of shifting the burden of proof, such that I am obliged to explain everything and they never have to explain or understand anything because they assume that they're right by default. And it's not enough that I have to disprove what they'll never accept, nor that they don't have to back up what they simply make up. I'm on the wire there too, because I have to disprove every empty, unsupported absurdity that every idiot ever hallucinated or, you know, I mean, this is why Hitchens' razor says that, you know, what is asserted without evidence may be dismissed without evidence. So that failing to disprove a negative, you know, I'm not then held to pretend that every, you know, every delirious fever dream, you know, from any junkie is on equal, equally valid standing with a scientific theory. For all their pretense at philosophical aptitude, there is no logic in theology or religious apologetics. Sometimes, though. Their promises to prove the existence of God are more amusing. Uh, many years ago, this one guy challenged me that he could prove that God existed, but it would require that I would have to go out into the desert and fast for a month. <laughs> Enduring the elements with no food or shelter, all the while praying to Jesus to reveal himself to me. So subject your body and your mind to undue stress while talking to yourself and pretending that somebody who isn't real and can't hear you is there listening. This is autodeceptive self-hypnosis. I promise you, if you go through this routine, it doesn't matter if you're talking to your God or someone else's false God, or it could be the ghosts of your dead ancestors. It could be your fantasy lover, your spirit guide, or extraterrestrial reptiles telep uh, transmitting telepathically because you forgot to wrap your head in tinfoil. If you talk to any of these imaginary beings as if they can hear you, it won't be long before you think they're trying to communicate with you. So, that wasn't the only criteria this guy had either. He also told me that I needed to put up $10,000 of my own money into a secure account to bet against his $10,000. And this wasn't, so far as I can tell, an attempt to steal my money. It was an attempt to raise the bar beyond my reach so that I could never actually meet the criteria that he demanded because he couldn't risk me taking him up on all of these other criteria and then still proving him wrong. They can't allow that anything would ever falsify their position. Now, Kent Hovind, the professional huckster behind creation science evangelism, had a, had a similar challenge to that, where he offered for a number of years a quarter million dollars to anyone who could provide proof, or excuse me, evidence, this is what he sold it, to anyone who could provide evidence of evolution. Now, I'm sure everybody in this room could provide evidence of evolution, of course, Hundreds of people did, trying to collect this money. But when you click the link on the website to meet that challenge, you find out that he's not actually asking for whatever you wouldn't accept, anything that would actually qualify as evidence of evolution. Instead, what he wants is proof that God couldn't do it. Not that God doesn't exist, because he, he won't accept that either. You have to assume that God does exist and still couldn't do it. So this is how they're marketing it through equivocation. And then there was another caveat beyond even that, because if your argument was that good, 
it would be referred to a handful of, of anonymous judges, nobody ever knew who they were, who had the right of refusal without communication or explanation, so that it didn't matter how many hundreds of people presented valid evidence of evolution, they still advertised that no one had ever tried to. So the whole thing was a fraud, just like Hovind himself. It doesn't matter that the faithful can't support their belief, as long as they never allow it to be falsified. They don't mind being credulously convinced with no justification whatsoever, as long as they can avoid all the proof that they're wrong. And lately, some have gone so far as to argue that reality itself is wrong. Remember, the, the, the Bible is the only source of truth in our world, so the whole rest of reality is, is false, right? And then you have that seminary professor who says that, rea that reality is immaterial and imaginary. So the real hardcore extremists go to idealism or presuppositionalism or hard solipsism. Those who don't go that far still have, uh, and still believe in a shared objective reality have to cast doubt on every aspect of science against them even though they completely trust in their own raving insanity without question. You know, being reinforced with you know, confirmation bias and double standards and fallacious reasoning against reasoning. That's why it's so important to them to reverse the burden of proof, which is another logical fallacy. So entice them, to entice them to take my challenge, I put the onus entirely on me. Remember, I'm trying to prove my point to their satisfaction, not mine, so that um, I can't win unless my interlocutor admits, in the end, that I made my point. How could you possibly go wrong, right? What, what is there to intimidate someone here? I mean, all you'd have to do is go through the entire uh, routine and then say, I don't believe you, and you win. How easy is that? Some religious zealots think that the way to make their case is to hound you forever and uh, never concede any, any error and never offer you any credit either, but to hit you relentlessly with thousands of messages of thousands of words each until you give up and give in. But that wasn't the way I did it. I put a, I put a time limit on mine. It was just a couple dozen mutual exchanges so that if I haven't proven my point by then, I lose. Again, how could I make this any easier for them? Yet I've had very few takers in 20 years. Why would anyone turn this down? I mean, think about it. It doesn't matter how strong or strident an atheist you are. If a seemingly sincere believer promises that they can prove their case to you, that they could prove a God to you, and especially if we think that there might be any credence to their argument, that in other words, the more likely we think that we might be wrong, the more likely we are to take that challenge. And if it turns out that it's not just a word game, like it so often turns out to me, if it, if it turns out that, that they actually have a point that we overlooked somehow that, that proves that they're right, we would change our minds accordingly and thank them for having corrected us. Because we come from a perspective wherein the truth matters. And you've probably already taken a challenge like this yourself. And, you, you expected that you're just going to get a word game, like the argument from improbability, where if you take everything that happened to you today or everything that you did today and just try to figure out how improbable all those things are, and every new parameter that you add only makes it more improbable so that everything that happened to you today is completely impossible. Or we have the argument of fine-tuning, where if the, these parameters are just a little bit this way or the other way, like, if, like the Earth, if it were its own di diameter closer to or further from the sun, then we couldn't exist. Right? And this somehow is supposed to imply a God. And this is the best when you have these person, not online, but you know, like face to face, and you get to explain to them that our orbit is elliptical, and that it varies by millions of kilometers in both directions, right? And you might see that, you might get to see that dumbfounded look of confusion that belays how wrong they are, but you'll never get a verbal admission, because the guy you're talking to doesn't care if it's right or wrong. He's going to use that same argument on the next guy. Because to him, the truth is irrelevant. All that matters is whether you believe. And if they have to lie to you, to fool you into believing, then that is what they'll do. And of course, if you have to lie in defense of your truth, then it was never really truth to begin with. But they don't care what the truth is, right? They believe in belief. That's why they say that if God didn't exist, it would be necessary to invent him. 
And so most of the believers I've challenged have refused to accept. And this is because I say that I will prove evolution so conclusively that they will have to declare themselves evolutionists for the rest of their lives. And they'll be embarrassed that they were ever creationists. And the people I'm talking to, wrongly, think that proving evolution means disproving God. And the very idea of that terrifies them. So they, they run, not walk away from this challenge. So I get responses like, why can't I believe what I want to believe? And they'll say this even after I've already proved that whatever they believed was wrong. Why would you want to continue to believe something after you know it's wrong? And not everybody knows that what they believe is wrong, but some of them do. I've got admissions phrased a number of ways that these may be the, what the facts are, but I prefer to believe this, you know? They know it's not true, but they're gonna believe it anyway. And a couple have even said they have the right to be wrong. So they know, what they, they, they are, they know they're wrong, and they want to stay that way. They know what the reality is, and that it's not what they want it to be, but they reject that reality because they want to believe something else. With only one exception, the few, the few creationists who did accept my challenge either defaulted or disappeared early on. Once they realized that the trap they walked into really will work, even if they lie, once they get to the end. Because even if they went through the whole routine, you know, and then simply said at the end that they didn't believe me, you know, I, my reputation would be ruined. I mean, I would, I, would have had, I would have lost credibility. But that's not enough incentive for, excuse me, that's not enough incentive for believers. Because they've already figured out that by that point, they would already know what they don't want to know. And their faith would be damaged more than my reputation. So even if they lied about whether I convinced them, they'd still be convinced. And they consider their faith too precious to risk, you know, much like a junkie considers his drugs valuable. Believers complain that when I show them the truth that I'm hurting people who just want to believe something other than reality. And the first time I did this challenge, it was on this one guy's uh, own personal blog. And I, as I come in to do my daily submission to that, I noticed that it was gone. I couldn't find the whole discussion. It was good, absent. So I looked up the guy's username and went to a few other locations to try to find him. And I found something I wasn't expected to read where he had admitted to one of his friends that he had deleted his own account because he realized I was making sense. <laughs> and he didn't want to change his mind or stop believing. How dishonest is that? He didn't want to stop believing something he now knew to be untrue, and he wants to believe it anyway. So a lot of people have asked me, what is my 12-step what is, what is program, or what are my questions? You know, but it's different for everyone, because all I'm doing is I'm listening to you explain your situation. I jump in to make whatever corrections are necessary, and then get you to verify that the, the corrections I've given actually are correct according to whatever means of verification necessary. It's an interactive educational attempt at the Socratic method. And creationists resist that with two excuses that are designed to dismiss everything. They hate the burden of proof so much that they refuse any responsibility to explain or even understand anything. And I'm sure you've already seen this, where you try to explain something to somebody that doesn't want to understand, you can see their eyes glaze over so that suddenly they, their face looks like a smiling, thoughtless mannequin. It's because they're chanting mantras in their head to block out forbidden knowledge. They didn't listen to anything you just said, but if they notice by the tone of your voice that you just asked them a question, they'll recall the last sentence you said only and say, well, that's how God did it, or some similar excuse. That's the best they've got, and it seems to work for them because it accounts for everything. And they don't even have to think about it. So then when you start talking again, you may as well be Charlie Brown's teacher because all they hear is wah, 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 wah. They don't know or care what you're saying, but they know that any evidence you try to show them can be dismissed with the phrase, that doesn't prove anything, which it doesn't for them because they don't know what the fuck you're even talking about. <laughs> That's why this has to be an interactive experience. I have to teach them how to think hypothetically because they don't know how. Every time you give them a hypothetical, they take it literally, like that's what you really believe. And I also have to teach them the rules about how to evaluate scientifically, which they refuse to do. I have to ask them questions to get them to think about what I'm trying to tell them, to engage them. And they have to pay attention because I'm also going to get them to confirm that they understand and accept each premise before we move on to the next one. 
and they get uncomfortable really fast. If they can't contest any confirmed factual points and still refuse to accept it, then we go no further. And to give you an example of that, I mean, they have to understand the theory as it is, not the way they want it to be. And one of the first debates I did of this kind, I was going up against somebody who identified as a government scientist. Don't know what the hell that is, but he was also uh, arguing that I used too many big words. <laughs> of course, y'all know about my government, so he might be right. <laughs> he said that uh, evolution was being taught in public schools as the religion of no godism. And except, of course, he wasn't able to produce one citation from any edu educational resource to back him up. And he refused to accept the whole list of college and high school textbooks that I presented that all uniformly said that it was, you know, allelic variants and reproductive populations over time and many generations, et cetera. He just ignores all of that because he doesn't want to believe it. So uh, having their whole position dependent on every logical fallacy ever listed means they only know how to be wrong. And they're absolutely wrong about absolutely everything relevant to this discussion. They may be perfectly rational, logical people in other avenues, but not when they're talking about religion. In any other application, they know that you can't assert baseless speculation as though it was fact. Because if you call it fact and it's not a fact, that's a lie, and everybody understands that except when they're defending the faith. Likewise, in any other avenue of everyday life, you can't just pretend to know things you don't actually know either. You know, that's called talking out of your ass. And again, everyone knows how dishonest that is, but that's what all religions do. That's all theology is. And I want everybody to understand, theology is just talking out of your ass about shit you don't know. <laughs> I know there's a whole lot of professional theologians that'll take issue with that. Good, bring it. <laughs> Remember, ignorance is phonetically pronounced ignorance. It isn't just what you don't know, it's what you won't know, what you refuse to acknowledge or understand. That's why I have to ask them questions to get their answers, because they're not going to accept my answers. And they can't turn around and object to their own answers later on when they see how it works against them, like they'll automatically dismiss all of mine. Then we correct those answers, if necessary, by whatever means of verification we can, or we use them as the basis for the next level of inquiry. So the catch is the most important rule, the rule that has tripped everyone who has failed my challenge over the last 20 years. I tell them all in advance, you cannot repeatedly ignore direct questions or we're done. I'm under no obligation to continue and you will have failed even though the onus was entirely on me because you can't explain anything to someone who's got their fingers in their ears, eyes closed, screaming that they can't hear you. They know what'll happen if they answer my questions. So they duck and dodge and dance and obfuscate and change the subject however they can so that trying to prove any point becomes like nailing jello to the wall. If you really thought that what you believe was true, you wouldn't act like that. Certainly not if understanding truth was more important than believing lies. So why do religious believers hate reality so much? Hopefully we've established by this point that they do. I can see the attraction of having imaginary, a magic imaginary friend like a genie who can fix any problem, even if it means occasionally making two plus two equal five, you know, on any given Sunday or whenever you need to. I saw a video by a YouTuber named Rachel Oates where she talked about how some people feel powerless and want a sense of agency. And maybe they feel like they can use the power of their, you know, evoke their gods and spirits or what have you to correct whatever they need. or. Maybe they can, they can get that same feeling if they can convince themselves that they understand things better than everyone else because things are not as they seem and only they hold the secret truth about what's really going on. Of course, these people don't usually understand much of anything and can't even find themselves on a map. But maybe pretending there's a God and they know him is how they compensate for that. I just wish they wouldn't call me the one who's lost. And some believers are so bitter I don't know if you've seen them. We get these in the States quite a bit. They're so bitter that they think that if there's no God, then human life has no value. That we're just animals, meaningless bags of chemicals, no more than meat machines. They look at life not as an adventure, experience to be played, but more as a horrible ordeal that they have to suffer through to get the reward in the end. Talk about hating reality. 
Now, they think that other equally credulous fools are better than rational thinkers. You know, not necessarily smarter or prettier, but better. And uh, maybe they're the chosen ones on occasion, but whatever, they are certainly holier than thou. And some even admit that if they didn't believe in God, they'd run around killing and raping and destroying everything just for the fun of it. That's how moral they are. Then I have to look at all of the, uh, the humanists among the infidels who don't think that violence is fun. Because without any threat of posthumous punishment whatsoever, we know that unnecessarily causing pain and suffering and death is immoral by definition, by definition meaning it's an objective standard. But you know, what do we know? We don't have a moral compass, right? Apparently, you have to believe impossible absurdities for no good reason if you're going to be a good person, except that those who believe in absurdities will commit atrocities. I've seen many different sources showing a negative statistical correla correlation between uh, morality and religious belief, where believers are more likely racist, sexist, prejudicial, xenophobic bigots. And although they hate abortions, they are more likely than we are to have one. And while they talk about the sanctity of marriage and they, they admit that according to their scriptures, divorce is a sin, they have a higher divorce weight than we do and we don't even have the mythology on it. We just have a simple contract between people and it doesn't even have to be opposite genders on every occasion. And we still have a better marriage system than they do. Studies have shown that people who were raised religious and stayed religious their entire lives are more likely to be convicted of sex crimes. And the more religious they are, the worse their offenses are with more and younger victims because religion is all about using that or holding a, a, a controlling aspect over weaker minds. Devout believers are more likely to be violent and support violence like corporal punishment, capital punishment, and torture of prisoners. They're far less tolerant of other religious and political views and of course they hate homosexuals for being fabulous abominations. And they hate us, atheists, because we're ruining their game of pretend. We at least, we don't play along and give them the moral high ground like the devil worshipers do. We admit that it's a game of pretend. That's why all the pretenders hate us so much. We don't buy into their delusion. And the psychiatric definition of delusion is a fixed false belief that will not change despite evidence to the contrary. However, there is a caveat that it's not considered a delusion if enough people believe it. So I guess a disease, I, I guess a plague isn't a disease if there's enough sick people for it to be pandemic. <laughs> and although the concept of the God virus has some merit, I don't view religion as a disease. I do see it as an addiction though. I see religious people as being hooked on something that they think makes them happy but is ultimately poisonous. And functional MRI scans of deeply religious people who claimed to be feeling the spirit during moments of prayer or worship uh, show a spike in activity in the parts of the brain associated with focused attention, with judgment and moral reasoning, and particularly the reward area of the brain. When the University of Utah published or released this study, they showed a picture of the brain scan and said, this is your brain on God. Because the same area of the brain shows activity when having sex, when doing drugs or when gambling, showing or suggesting you know, that there's a common bound to these uh, seemingly disparate behaviors that are all connected to addiction. An addictive dependence on faith prompts the believer to defend their belief as they defend themselves because their identity is erroneously intertwined with it. And that's why former believers are like ex-smokers. They're, the they're the loudest opponents of their own former habits. Affliction with religion no longer has to be the chronic, debilitating condition it once was. With treatment, full recovery is possible. Religion is the opiate of the masses because it is very much like an addiction. I've read de deconversion stories where believers suddenly seem lost all at once because for the first time ever, they don't think that there's an all-seeing eye watching everything they do every minute of every day. How do people live like that? You know, I mean, especially in the southern United States, the most religious part of the most religious country in the Western world, yet with the highest rates of violence crime, with the lowest education, with the most use of addictive drugs, and with the highest consumption of gay porn. If your God is a judgmental father figure who hates any sort of sexual enjoyment, 
How would you beat that? When could you beat that? <laughs> Finally, somebody gets that joke. <laughs> Of course, the fear of death is a big point for believers. They don't want to die, you know, but we all die. You know, no religion saves you from that, regardless what your religion is. All of us run equal risk of finding ourselves writhing in agony on the floor, clutching our chest, vainly straining to take that last breath. You know, religion may promise you an immortality after you die, but you know, that's the only part of death that I'd actually rather avoid. You know, I'm not afraid of being dead, it's getting dead. <laughs> that can be a terrifying, terrifying transformation. Life is precious because it is short. And humans tend to value that which is rare. But I heard a pastor say that if he can't believe that he will be immortal and still be alive five billion years from now, then there's no reason to be alive now. He said that if he can't live forever, then there's no reason to prolong anyone's life or improve their life or ease their suffering. Because if he can't be immortal, then everything is meaningless. What's the point? <laughs> there is no point. Shut up and get over it. This is what you get, and that's it. So you better make the best of it and enjoy it while you can, because we don't go anywhere when we die. We just shut off forever. Game over, man. You won't feel anything, know anything, be anything. It'll be just like it was eons before you were born. Do you remember that? Of course not. You won't remember death either. You won't be an angelic spirit looking down. You'll be monkey meat stinking up. So this is as good as it gets right now while you live because there's nothing and you're nothing after you die. That's the fact and nobody likes it. The closest anyone gets to immortality is how we're remembered and what our lives meant to someone else. But people don't want to accept that that's how it really is. It's like the guy who won't acknowledge that his marriage is over and that his wife is cheating on him and never loved him. Everyone else knows that. She shows him no compassion at all. I mean, it's plainly obvious to everyone else, but he can't accept it emotionally, so he would rather not know the truth. And if anybody's ever known anyone in a situation like that or lived in a demeaning situation like that, imagine what it must be for religious believers who live like that all the time, pretending to be loved by someone who really isn't there for them and refusing to acknowledge what everybody else can see. And everything that we know about God shows that he's no better than the cheating spouse. All the scriptures of every religion describe God as, a narciss as, a, as an abusive narcissist. You know, so that even if there was God, he's no good for you. Break it off and you'll be better off. And I know you don't want to be alone. You don't want to be scared. You know, maybe you saw a video where, you know, they have the, the time lapse thing of the night sky. You know, you see the mountains and you see the stars going by and you see them all in unison. But if you speed that video up, you, you actually see that for the first time, maybe you've noticed that we really are on a rock, spinning, hurtling through space like the Titanic chugging along through an inhospitable abyss, but with no captain, no one to direct or protect us, steaming toward an inevitable, eventual doom. That's scary. And think about how pointless it is that all your achievements will be for completely forgotten when the last living, thinking person dies, or maybe even before that. Yet the universe will continue for billions of years without us and without knowledge of us. And some people think that there's got to be a God because it would be so pointless for that to happen. But then how pointless was it that there were billions of beautiful sunsets from gorgeous vistas all throughout Earth's history when there was not yet a single life form that had developed a brain capable of appreciating that? How much splendor was wasted in Earth's distant past when all our lives now we're based on so many, it came at the cost of so many other lives before us. The more you know about geologic history, the less intelligence we see in life's design and the more evidence we have against God, the more necessity we have to you know, bound to our lovers, or excuse me, to love our neighbors and to help each other ease our suffering and make the most of our lives because we are all we've got. Any office celebrating a secret Santa knows there is no Santa 
and that the only charity really comes from us. And very recently I had a conversation with a religious devotee who believes as he does because he values the meaning of life, as so many of them do. They are purpose-driven. And this idea of purpose is one that always confused me. Of all the cited reasons for religious belief, this is the one that I find complete loss at explaining. The idea that life has a purpose is just stupid to me. I mean, it's like when you go to the fortune teller and she throws the chicken bones or the tea leaves and then tries to read what they mean. You know, it's completely random. It doesn't mean anything and neither does our existence on this planet. So I asked him, what is this purpose to which he is so committed? And he said that the purpose of not just his life but of everybody's life is to praise God for all of eternity. That's it, is it? You want to be trapped with an inescapable, indomitable, invulnerable, immortal, who can read your mind so you better not think any bad thoughts he doesn't like. <laughs> and you have to forget what a monster he was in all of the scriptures. And you have to overlook all the mistakes that he obviously made in all of these books. And instead, you're just supposed to kiss his ass and tell him how great he is forever and ever and ever. And you think that this gives purpose to someone's life? That's not God's purpose for creating you. That's your purpose for creating God. And it indicates that your life has no meaning. Fortunately, I give my own life whatever meaning I choose, if I choose. It's not even really required. I do it when I want to, if I want to. God has no purpose for me, nor I for him, because God is just a phantasm. And I don't need a fantasy. I'd rather keep it real. Thank you very much.